Thanks for finding this podcast and welcome. I'm Simon Murnau. And I'm Nikki Blue. What you're about to hear is a conversation between two friends who grew up in the 80s, discovering goth music and culture along the way. We're going to be talking about the albums we love most from that era and how they fit into the stories of our lives at that time. It's not in any way objective or comprehensive. We're also going to talk about what the goth and alternative scene meant to us and how it made us, in part, who we are today. This is a love letter, really, and a thank you to the goth scene and to all the people and ideas we found within it. You know who you are. This is for you. If you want to keep updated about this podcast and our upcoming book of the same name, please join our email list from the link in the bio. Thank you for the darkness. We're going to move on to this gorgeous man, aren't we? Okay, yeah, absolutely, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so, hi, Stu. Hello, Hello. Stu. Hello. Hey, guys, good to, good to sort of hear you talking through all that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. What I thought I would do, if it's okay with you, I'll kind of give you a whistle-stop tour of my story as it intersects with the things that you've been talking about in the series so far. Does that sound Perfect. okay? yeah. Yeah, yeah sounds so we brilliant. can just kind yeah. of make some of those connections, and I can yeah, give you yeah. my my goth bona fides if you if you yeah, like yeah can so, i just ask you just uh, before you embark on that there's some nice guitars behind you they i don't think they were there when i saw you yesterday it's funny i just sort of arranged <laughs> I just them sort of moved in there. <laughs> just randomly arranged them oh um, yeah you, you was just noodling yeah, yeah. You just threw them threw yeah, them I down that, there yeah. i thought that, that was really right. unfair nice so, i know, so. I know. <laughs> um so 1986 uh i met you nick in the spring yeah. of 1986 i was 15 so I'm considerably wow. younger than both of you, actually. I mean, I don't yeah. really make too much of a big deal of that, but it is. Uh, I, I was <laughs> so the first person you slept with, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> we went to we went to different schools. So I was at the uh, yeah. I was at the boys' school, which had delusions of grandeur. It used to be a grammar school, and it still thought that it was. It was very, uh, yeah. very stiff and um, yeah. you know, not terribly exciting. Um, but I had sort of made an acquaintance with a guy, and we were we sort of put a. A band of sorts together. Um, it was a kind of synth pop band. Uh, he had a Morrissey fixation, so it was kind of like Depeche Mode Smith's combo. It really wasn't good. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable yeah. combination. Yeah, I, I, can, yes. I, can, I can back that up. It really wasn't good. No. <laughs> and at some point, we acquired a guitarist, uh, a, a mutual, what became a mutual friend, of course, Ben, ben Moonsey, who oh, yeah. you remember, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was Ben that ended up introducing me to you. Uh, he it. dragged me along to a rehearsal that he had with you um, uh, some, sometime around that time, and I'll, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but I guess, um, Nick, you could sort of, in a sense, you turned me, right? So you probably turned me into a goth in that sort of vampire yeah. sense. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think guilty so is charged. I was into what I would think of at the time as, as sort of alternative music. I liked uh, bands like Japan. I was, I was hugely the alarm. the alarm. If you remember The yeah. Alarm, they, they thought mm. they were the second mm. coming of The Clash, but most of yes. thought they were just they a weren't. pastiche. Um, yeah, with, with more fair. hair. <laughs> yes. But to the impressionable teen, they were tremendously exciting. And I saw them yeah. live lots of times and they were really fabulous. And they had that sort of aesthetic, which wasn't so far away from, from the goth look, a very big hair and a bit of makeup yeah, yeah. and so on and so forth. So it wasn't a long journey, but I think you probably it sort of took me over the line there, Nick, at some point. Yeah. So I remember coming to a rehearsal and uh, it was somewhere in, in St. Leonard's, I think. And it was with you. Um, it was with Steve May, our good friend, still good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume Simon Manning was there. Yeah. Um, I think we had Steve Brooks on drums, if you remember That's Steve right. Brooks, Simone's yeah. brother, yeah. Uh, who I went to school with. And at, so at some point, and I think I came along to play keyboards, actually. Um, but at some point, the others dropped away, or I muscled in, or blagged my way in on <laughs> which I could barely play at the time, and, and some may say uh, barely still can. 
No, <laughs> no, that's how it started. And so I think you sort of took me under your wing a little bit, as I recall it, Nick. So I was yeah. two years younger. Yeah. I can remember you taking me to Subdiffusion Brighton, and it was a little bit of an eye-opener. Um, ah, that would have yeah. been that year, I think. I can remember us going to see the mission in Brighton in November 1986. Yeah. Wow. I have the ticket here at the top rank. I think that's probably the first gig that we went to together. I think it's probably the first gig that you would say was a goth band that I had been to see up until then. Um, so very much, I think I was, I think I was your project to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I you, mean, that I, you were going to turn him. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going yeah. to sort of freak well, him out. I, I have to admit that I was just a very, very shallow man, <laughs> and 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 you looked like the kind of guitarist that I wanted in my band. And obviously, I liked you. Uh, and uh... secondary, though. <laughs> secondary. <laughs> secondary. It, it helps, it was... but it's not essential. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, but you look cool. And uh, and I was desperate to form this band and become the next, you know, cure cult, whatever. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so that that's why I took you un under my wing. I think, if I'm honest. <laughs> Very good. And I have to confess, Simon, I don't remember exactly the day or the situation that I first met you, but it was obviously through Nick. That yes. You were at school together yes. and knew each yes. other, and. About that time, I guess we would have started going to the crypt on a Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah. So it was probably part of that ritual. I can remember, and then certainly there is photographs of this happening. We yeah. would go to your mum and dad's house, Nick. Yeah, and sort of get ready. You know, the spend three hours getting ready. Exactly, the substantial task of backcombing the hair and putting the makeup on, yeah. and yeah. Uh, getting ready to to hit town. And I, yeah. I think that's probably where I where I met you, Simon, for the first yeah. time. And, uh, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. So yes, along much with the of, hair. <clears throat> indeed, indeed. And, and, you know, uh, maybe it's a bit obvious, but uh, yeah, that I had more hair then than I do <laughs> now. Um, no one's going to argue that. <laughs> yeah. So much of, much of the rest of the story you've covered, but maybe I'll just kind of touch on a few things. So 1987, yeah. Uh, 8th of April 1987 at the Crypt was our first gig. Um, as a terrible hoarder of things, I have sort of found some scraps that tell me that tickets were one pound. Uh, oh, yeah, really? We, we earned a princely sum of 30 pounds for that gig. First gig, not bad. Christ, I don't it's think actually we, not bad. I don't yeah, think we've got for... much beyond that in our entire career, actually. No, no. <laughs> so, um, I wonder that... what we spent it on. <laughs> Who knows? Like black. Who Snake, knows? Snake probably yeah. probably yeah. the taxi yeah. home or something. I don't yeah. know. Well, that um, must have given you delusions of grandeur. 30 quid. Yeah, I mean, no. you know, it, the, the only the way is up from waiting. There. Yeah. Exactly. Top, yeah. Top yeah. Of the next. Um, I even have the set list, um, which obviously had some of the early things that we had written together, but a surprising number, when I look back at it, a surprising number of cover versions. So yeah. let me just kind of read you the cover versions from that gig. Painted yeah. Black, Stones, obviously. Uh, cool. 1969, obviously Stooges song, but sort yeah. of made famous really because the sisters were covering it, That's it. at yeah. that time, and, and then yeah. latterly the mission also. It was uh, also incredibly easy to play, wasn't it? It was bloody yeah. easy. <laughs> it's like it's sort of D, D with a sort of pull off, and, yeah. and there you are. Yeah, exactly. exactly. We love pulling off as well. Uh, we did Take It As It Comes by The Doors. Oh, I uh, remember. Uh, mm. She's So Sanctuary. Cult, obviously. God, wow. uh, and a bit of a deep cut. This one, M by the Cure. You know, that's ah, one for the it, one for the oh, fanatics. Yeah. Interestingly, yeah. as yeah. Robert Smith has just done a a, a charity uh, live saw, uh, yeah. show, yeah, and he did M in that, which was interesting. Yeah. Mm. They still play it occasionally live. Mm. Um, there's, yeah. a whole, yeah. there's a whole separate podcast on the Cure. Actually, um, we should do that at some point because they've expanded our entire life and i still feel grateful yeah. that i'm alive at the time that the cure have been alive. yeah me too me too yeah yeah um so 87 for the gigs um including those early ones simon where you read some poetry at the beginning oh yes oh yeah referenced how uh, could we forget lonely elf indeed <laughs> lonely um, elf. although the simon manning used to call you uncle bulgaria <laughs> is that right <laughs> the is that right? why <laughs> because i was a womble I, I don't get it. I don't get One the reference. Ball. One ball. 
We'll come back to that. We'll so come back to that. Oh, I see. Right. Yes. Let's <laughs> leave that he, in obscurity. He, he was a he was a cruel man. He was a cruel man, wasn't he? And, <laughs> and when he got his teeth into a cruel joke, he would never let it go. Don't we all know? Yeah, yeah we so, all do. So, We've so all part of this of story it. later, we're going to tell through the eyes of Simon Manning. Um, yeah. As, yes. we, as we get to that point. So 88, I think you've covered this. We were still in Hastings. We were kind of starting to get some gigs in London and hiring coach loads of rent a crowd to come and see us. Uh, and they were <laughs> literally the only people there apart yeah. from oh, the sound yeah. engineer. Um, I don't know whether you told the cat house story, did you, Nick? No, you, I think no. That's, that's escaped us so far. Yeah, you so would, that was 88 that? as well. So we were terribly excited to be offered a gig in Birmingham in a place called the Cat House, which sounded tremendously exciting and glamorous. And, yeah. um, you know, this was our first foray, I think, outside. Just to say uh, just something before you start with the Cat House thing, Stu, mm -hmm. is that this, this was an era uh, that had been introduced by Guns N' Roses that come along, a uh, fucking shithole of a band uh, and a misogynistic, racist shithole of a band. Uh, uh, and uh, but we thought they were quite cool at the moment and thought that we maybe we should align themselves ourselves with that movement okay. well yeah i mean we can maybe get into that a, a little later but there was a sort of a period of kind of crossover wasn't there between that sort of what you would what you'd listen to in the in what would originally have been the goth clubs had started to introduce some of that sort of glam glam rocky stuff as well so anyway yeah. yes i was um I was going to say the 1988 Cat House gig, which we were all very excited about because it was the first, it was the first time we'd been asked to play outside of London or, you know, our, our sort of normal manner in, in Hastings oh, and Brighton. In the South. Exactly. So this sounded very exciting. It sounded, it, it had the same name, I think, as a, one of the clubs in LA. And so that's how we were thinking about it. Um, we had to hire a driver to take us up to to Birmingham, which is where it was. In fact, it wasn't quite Birmingham. It was, it was on the outskirts of Birmingham, um, sort of, I forget what the name was. It Stourbridge? I think that sounds right. Actually, that, Stourbridge. I think yeah. where Popolite itself came from. Stourbridge. Yeah. It sounds, sounds stellar. You know, yeah. it sounds a bit like sort of LA or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so so we we drove there and it's a long drive. It's, I don't know, whatever it took us. Uh, and we arrived um, and it, looked a little bit like a community center <laughs> and I exactly think what it was that's because it was a community center it was a community oh center. no it called and the they, cat house they yeah. asked us whether we would like um what kind of sandwiches we'd like with our cup of tea when we got there <laughs> run, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean i don't remember much about it nick you might remember more but i do remember playing i remember we had a smoke machine and we filled the whole place with smoke and there was literally the sound no. engineer and a dog there. I don't think yeah. there was a single <laughs> single punter. There was one man oh, in the audience. Else. An absolute disaster. Oh, it was a disaster. Is... Uh, it's gone down in legend, really. So, uh, do, you, do you remember what happened at the end? I think I might. Are you going to share it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a as a dirty protest. <laughs> oh no! Me and Simon Manning of Children of Children of Stun fame that you'll be coming to very shortly, no doubt. <laughs> I decided that. We weren't happy with having travelled eight hours it took us to get up there uh, and decided that we'd do a big shit on the, in the middle of the dressing room floor oh, uh, as a dirty man. protest and leave them with that. So if you're watching tonight, Cat House from Storebridge, it was me <laughs> that shat in the middle of your dressing room floor. Fucking have that, all right? Okay. Well, that's, 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 uh, yeah. that's settled yeah. that one after that's, 30 yeah. years, isn't it? I'm sure yeah. they've all been wondering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, should have, you should have just like written on a post thing to it, Shut House. Shut House. That <laughs> oh, would have been, very that good. Would have been the one. Very yeah. good. Very good. So, anyway, moving on quickly. I don't want to take up too much time here. So, 89, we moved to London. We lived in that hellhole <laughs> in Neasden with you. Oh, God. Oh, Ryan, yeah. And Tom. Uh, for only six months, it felt like a lifetime. Yeah, um, it really was uh, appalling. Mostly, um, mostly to do with your and Simon, yours and Simon's behaviour. Really, Nick, to be honest with really? you, really, in terms of it was your atrocious. aversion, aversion to buying toilet roll and that sort of thing was, was yeah. part of the issue. You, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember we had the, the, in one of the storms that we had the roof blew off, so there was a sort of meter square 
hole in the roof, uh, which obviously was letting in water, and so there was rain pouring through the ceiling. And the Into landlord was a bit the landlord was a bit difficult, so we got it, Mr. Ali, sorted. Yeah, Mr. Ali, we got some builders to sort it, as I recall. Uh, so they came and fixed the roof. And then Mr. Ali wouldn't pay them, so they came back and took the took the roof off again. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow! God, I don't remember that. And then one, really? of, one of them put his foot wow. through my ceiling. Um, so yeah, that was um, that was a pretty heavy time. Uh, wow. By 1990, God. we were still in London. I had moved in with my my dear wife uh, of now, Fiona, in Hackney. Um, mm -hmm. So that was around about that time. Um, we split up um, the band around 91, I think, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Covered that in these before. Yes, yes. And you referenced it, Simon. You and I started to play right. in, in a couple of bands. Well, the same band with different names, I suppose, would be a better way to put it. Yes, um, yes. And you were living with us in Hackney and, yes. um, you know, around about that time. And, of yeah. course... Um, Yes, around, I mean, the other big thing that happened then, and maybe it sort of leads us into um, some of what we're going to talk about, there was a very, very big change around about that time. I don't know if you remember what it was. I'm going to tell you. No, so no. I'm, I got I'm my intrigued. hair cut. <laughs> so you got, got yeah, the, yes, yes, gone, indeed. Yes. Gone was the long, blonde, crimped hair, and, and its place was a, was a slightly misplaced sort of bob. And I, I thought it looked a little bit more kind of grunge. Uh, other people less kind um, compared it to pop sensation at the time, Chesney Hawks. Uh, yeah, I, the, I was yeah. horrified. It definitely was. One it was for the kids. Chesney. It yeah. was yeah. horrified. Yeah. yeah, one for the kids. I thought you'd sold out. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And I, I, but maybe I did. Um, so I, I certainly gave a good go at sort of being a grown up around about that time. I think Fiona and I got engaged. And, yeah. uh, you know, happily we were married the next year and we've been married for 27 years. So, um, I, I gave... it's a fair stab then. I said fair stab yeah. at being grown up. Yeah. I was grown up for quite a while and then I decided it was overrated and, uh, and kind of gave it up in my forties. So <laughs> here we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that sort of, I think that sort of brings us up to date with where you'd got to. I've got a yeah. few other mm. sort of mm. reflections that we can maybe weave in as yeah. we get through the story. But one of the things that we talked about is, seeing this next period of time through the eyes of um, our dear departed friend, Simon Manning, because he That's was right. so keen to continue to plough his kind of goth furrow and, uh, and to yeah. sort of stay true to the cause, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we, we split up the band at the time. Uh, he moved back to Hastings. And it's not that we lost contact, but we weren't in quite the same sort of tight circle um, that no. we were. Um, and maybe just a word on that, actually. I think, you know, Nick, you, you personally deserve a huge amount of credit for keeping that enormous group of friendships together over the years because you were always the one that made sure that people stayed in touch and, and yeah. if we didn't see each other for, you know, more than once or twice a year. We always did. So yeah. yes. uh, I think I thank you for that. And you referenced, yeah, I think, in that's... a previous episode. I, I put that down to being an, an only child. And uh, I think I've always been a bit of a collie a collie dog and that I round people up oh, yeah. and my, my family are uh, in the world as opposed to in mm. my family. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, that's my motivation really. Yeah. Mm. So that I think sort of is, you know, the, the, the story up until now. And, you know, we wanted to talk, I think about what happened next in the, in the kind of goth space really. Yeah. And, and it yeah. felt yes. to me at least, I mean, maybe you guys want to sort of intro it, but, it felt to me that it was a pivotal time um, that coincided with changes in our own lives and yeah. changes in the way that some of the that the bands were, you know, some of the bands that we'd followed. Um, well, their, that's their right. Yeah. Paths. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the some of the big bands uh, were undergoing changes. Yeah. And we've we've sort of touched on this all the way through, really, about that the 80s were the sort of golden age, if you like, or the sort of like the, the first wave of big goth bands and uh, it was a very eclectic very uh, in some regards experimental it was a it was a broad church during much of the 80s and then it crystallized into a movement and uh, you had the sort of like the the big beasts like Bauhaus um even though Bauhaus were gone by was it 85 85 yeah pretty um, early 
Yeah, um, yeah. And sisters, you know, they, their first incarnation was gone by 85, uh, but then they returned with Floodland and then with the um, questionable vision thing. Oh in, was that 91 or 90, Stuart? Actually, that's, think, on, that's a nice little segue to talk to, to pick you up on there, uh, Stu, and your, your, your period of self-harm watching the sisters that you've told me about. Well, I mean, that comes much later in a sense. Yes, and, I mean, yes, yes. 91, the, I mean, the, the, to answer your question, Simon, so vision thing I think was 1990. Okay, yes. It was, it's yes. always earlier than you think, like Floodland, I think, yeah. was 87. Yes. Um, and yeah, as, 87. As most people knew and loved them, you yeah. know, kind of disappeared in 85 and never really sort of... Um, hit those heights again so yeah i think vision thing was 1990 and the sisters played the reading festival in 1991 on yeah. a sunday night and i can remember going for the day and the, the place was an absolute quagmire it was you know horrendously muddy we all sort of traipsed in there to see the sisters and they were absolutely appalling absolutely really? appalling um, they were that unfor good. unforgivably bad and they've been unforgivably bad live for another 30 years. If yes, anybody's had the yes. misfortune to go and see them, they are shocking, like a pub band um, playing covers of yeah. songs. Uh, really awful. Um, yeah, uh, Probably another podcast on that entire subject. Actually. Indeed, indeed. I mean, yeah, just to chime in on that, they've just removed every nuance and detail and uh, sort of soft note or... Uh, yes, every nuance Strategy. from the music, and it's turned into sort of a chugging Cock rock. pub rock band, uh, you know, and even tracks like Marianne that in the official recording has all these sort of lovely details, little shimmering bits over it. That's all gone, isn't yeah. it? It's all just mm. power chords yeah. and chugging through the number. Yeah. yeah. Shit show. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what was I going to say? Just roughly, to sort of in intro all of that. So, um, yes, I mean, I I had a feeling that I lost lost contact with goth, or that goth disappeared in the early nineties for me, and I turned my sights elsewhere. And whilst I still loved a lot of the older bands, I wasn't seeking uh, alternative, or I wasn't seeking goth bands uh, in particular during the nineties because I felt that goth had sort of disappeared into its own echo chamber. And we've touched on that in previous weeks. But Stuart, I think, is going to talk uh, through his experience uh, about of Simon Manning and Children on Stan. And it brings a new perspective to an era which I had largely dismissed as just nowhere and having completely lost its creativity and lost its mojo. So, I mean, if you yeah. want to come in on that, Stuart. I, I will. I mean, I mean, firstly, I think it's important to say that all of these things are just a certain perspective, right? So I've got, got no special, special insight. Back in. On we go with the episodic nature of our yeah, shitposting third... podcast. <laughs> What's it called? Shitposting. Shitposting. Okay. So we're, we're, we're in the third incarnation well yeah yeah they'll, be, they'll be tied in yeah and i'm yeah. getting more drunk each time is that right yeah it's, it's getting very dangerous i'm it's becoming dangerous. more and more worried yeah well you should be worried you should be. <laughs> i haven't been drunk in two years in two years no no uh, no, no no will you be drunk for two years <laughs> uh, no no probably a year i haven't been drunk actually okay so i think what so, we were we were just starting to sort of reflect on <clears throat> what happened around about this time period Yes, when, it, when yes. it comes to goth music, and and we said that to to an extent, it's always a certain perspective that you're bringing. And there's nothing special that I bring to it other than my own perspective. But it did seem that um, most of us, when we were talking about our own stories, there was some change around this time. Yes, and so it's tempting to think that it was maybe just that that made us think <laughs> that, that uh, something had changed in the scene. But actually, when you look at the when you look at the data there are other things to <laughs> yes. support it so i was looking through you know kind of key releases around that time and we talked yeah. a bit about the festivals already i think but you know certainly yes. late 80s um there was you know often a sort of goth day or sometimes more than one day at the big sort of festivals like reading yeah in 1991 you had 
sort of the tail end of some things like you know the cult release ceremony which was largely ignored oh, fucking all yeah she's really superstition not their finest work yes which is you know, arguably not a goth album even yeah. barely an alternative album mm, really exactly uh, fields of the nephilim were basically done by by this time period so they mm-hmm. released a live album and split up in 91 mm-hmm. Um, interestingly, and we'll come to this band a little later, Rosetta Stone and I for the Main Chance was released in 91. Yeah. Um, they were part of that sort of new wave of, of sort of more underground goth. Yeah. And then in 92, which is the year that we were focused on here, not much happened at all. I mean, The Cure released Wish, which was a fine album, but not really at the level of disintegration its predecessor and not really yeah. one that you would think is uh, their finest work the sisters were done you know they were releasing yeah. compilation albums the Mili- the mission released mask which was sort of where they really fell off a cliff and they'd sort of started to sound a little bit of their of the time really you know there was lots of violins coming in there it was sounding a little bit sort of levelers type yeah. sound so i think a lot of people walked away from the mission around that time and so you were starting to see the end of that period of really sort of mainstream bands with yeah. you know, people associated with goth. And there was that period in the late sort of 80s where you'd have the Mission and the Sisters on on top of the Pops and all of that, Eve on top of the Pops and the Cult and, yeah. know, and all these sort of um, bands sort of headlining the big festivals. And then suddenly that stopped and partly people are sort of, uh, associated that with the sort of rise of the grunge scene and Nirvana and, and, and those sorts of bands. Yeah. But it very, very quickly, it seems to me, um, stopped being, you know, at the same level. And uh, a lot of those bands either disappeared or, or were less successful than they had been. And yeah. so what you started to see was kind of goth moving back to a more of an underground movement. Um, in a couple of different ways. Um, one way I think was the kind of rise of the club scene, um, you know, and sort of a, a very good friend of ours, Alan Pelling, I think referred um, a, a couple of occasions on this pod, was, yes. was very much into that uh, <laughs> club scene around his own club, Torch Garden. At the yeah. Slime Light, I think most people would say sort of reached its zenith in, in the sort of 90s. I wasn't particularly a sort of frequenter um, then. Well, you say that. But, but, you know, that sort of, that kind of club scene um, became a little bit more sort of industrial. Bands like Front 242 and It's Reb and, you know, eventually Nine Inch Nails and things like that. That was kind of where where that scene was at. And then in terms of the bands, it was, for me, it felt a little bit more unapologetically goth. So that template that had been, established by the early sisters and the mission and so on was kind of taken um and by a number of bands like rosetta stone and and children on stun who simon yeah. um neil and kyle uh, were actually pete and then eventually kyle um were in sort of took it forward and it was it's not that it was a pastiche i don't mean that to sound condescending but it was unapologetically goth in the sense of that sort of mid 80s sound and and then sort of evolved it from there um, and didn't sort of have quite the same mainstream effect but but nonetheless you know was a you know a vibrant scene i think in 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 lots of places that ha- perhaps had we been a different age that would have yeah. been important to us but we just yeah. happened to have not been um, sort of as did it ev- did it evolve though you were saying you know they sort of carried it forward or or did they sort of crystallize it and you know, stay stay within the boundaries of the template. I think to, to, some did, and you know, some I'm, I'm sure some people evolved it. But it was as much about the um, the audience and the scene and sort of that sort of camaraderie and and sort of going to gigs and that being the important the important part of it. And I know that yeah. Simon uh, Manning, who we you know we've referenced here. You know that was really his. He was so excited about it. I mean, I remember when they got the, the one of the early support tours with Rosetta Stone. They were absolutely psyched about that, and they achieved a, a degree, you know, a good degree of success. He you know, released yeah. Yeah. a number of albums, Children on Stun, um, to, to to pretty good acclaim. And you know, if you asked someone at that time, they would have said, 
you know they were an important part of the of the goth scene at the, at the yeah. time and so they not, not just in england either they, no no they not were at all not at all well, well, in, 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 in europe, europe and america lot. yeah exactly so you know I, I think when you look back on the 90s there are you know a handful of bands depending on where you where you were and you know they they were one of the one of the important bands at that time and and, and so yeah. he really made his mark and we we didn't lose touch with him nick i don't think but he did sort of drift a little bit into a different circle so yeah. we weren't as close i mean i can remember going to see them many times yeah. um, but we weren't in that sort of tight knit circle of friends um that uh, that was sort of following the bands and and so that you know definitely was a change i think for all of us around around about that time yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things I didn't understand at that time uh, was uh, why Goth and the sound that Simon Manning and Children on Stun and some of the related bands were, were, you know, the music they were making, why it seemed so, in my ears, uh, retrograde. Um, and I would have used the word pastiche back then as creating a sound like the sisters and like the sort of early classics of goth and not really wanting to change that um, to sort of repeat the formula uh, without without any real uh, evolution, which is why I picked up on that what word, you know, did they evolve it? Um, and I think through this podcast and through discussing with you, Stuart, uh, what was happening there it's given me a new perspective and a lot of what we talked about uh, uh, through this throughout this podcast is you know what is goth and we kind of hit upon this definition that it made us feel as young people a certain way it opened up a space to explore darker feelings to allow uh, areas of our experience expression that uh, it wasn't allowed in other areas of our life and I think uh, what you've opened my eyes to, Stuart, is that um, repeating that formula was not just a failure of imagination. It was a wish to continue in that space, continue to allow those emotions expression and continue to sort of inhabit that space that Goth had opened up at an earlier time, but to keep that open. And so it served not just an artistic um, but a psychological and an emotional purpose, I think. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. And um, you know, when you've talked about what is goth in the past, I think you've referenced this idea that it's it's in some senses it's a sound, right? It's kind of a, a, a yes. certain style of music. There's a certain sort of style of writing words as well, so that kind of darkness in the words and so yeah. on. But there's also an aesthetic, right? And there's a sort of the way that yeah. people were looking at that time, the way they were dressing. But but importantly, I think, the way that they were socialising as well. And so yeah. this is kind of part of the way that people socialised was going to gigs and sort of watching bands that uh, made music that they like. And because of the absence of um, any of the the kind of the legacy bands, if you like, making yeah. anything of any importance around about that time, that vacuum was filled by, um, you know, other kind of more underground bands stepping in and making music that people wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, and the the only sort of unique perspective I have on it, I suppose, is because um, uh, later, much much later, actually, in um, uh, sort of twenty fifteen, um, after Simon passed away, sadly. Um, in fact, let me start the story a couple of months earlier. Uh -huh. in, May of 2015, um, Children on Stun reformed after splitting up in the late 90s uh, and did a, a sort of triumphant reunion gig that I went to at the Islington Academy. And I've never yeah. seen our friend Simon Manning so happy as he was <laughs> after that gig. He was absolutely buzzing because that was really his kind of, kind of almost his life's work. It was really what he, what yeah. he loved doing. And yeah. they were, I was talking to him in the bar afterwards and he, they were making plans uh, to play more gigs in Leeds and Nottingham, I think, um, and just kind of starting again. And it was it was really a wonderful evening. And um, sadly, yeah. that chat that I had with him in the bar in Islington was the last time that I saw him. It was the last time I spoke to him, and he, and he passed away in July that year, very sadly for for all of us. Um, 
at the funeral, at Simon's funeral, I got chatting with Neil and Kyle, who I knew, um, I did know, and Neil and I went to school together, actually, and I knew Kyle. Uh, yeah. Uh, of our mates, and we talked about uh, doing a charity gig to raise money for the British Heart Foundation um, in memory of Simon, uh, and for me to step in as a one-off on guitar. Uh, so that's what we did. It was Simon's birthday around about October that year. We played the Brass Monkey, which is just a few doors up from the crypt in Hastings, uh, and it was great fun. Um, and in the process of those rehearsals, I kind of got to know the songs again, and I realized how strong they were and what great performers and, and, and wonderful people actually Neil and Kyle were and how sad it was that uh, having got back together, they were curtailed again. Uh, mm. Times mm. and time passing. So we kind of agreed to carry on and I, I had a brief period um, of uh, I think a couple of years where I played guitar with them um, and it was, it was great fun. We played a handful of gigs, not, not more than, I don't know, maybe four or five a year. Um, and we would go to places like Leeds and Edinburgh and London and, and so on. And what you really got a sense of was there was a hugely loyal following yeah. that had kind of waited 20 years for them to come and play again and knew every song, knew every word and was wow. extraordinarily dedicated. And it was, I mean, it was a privilege really. And I said that at the time and I, and I still believe it now. It was uh, at the time of my life, um, I had lots of fun and uh, I'm very grateful for that, that brief period. It was, I've just got a, a small uh, additional story actually, if I may. So it was always yeah. tinged with a bit of sadness because, you know, Simon should have been there and, you know, he would have been proud of that legacy. And one of the particular highlights was we played at the, the Whitby Goth Festival in mm -hmm. November 2016. And uh, yeah. again, there's probably a whole podcast on the Whitby Goth Festival actually, but um, <laughs> another time. And we were on the same <clears throat> bill as the Mission and the Skeletal Family. Um, and Simon would have been absolutely thrilled with that. Totally, um, yeah. So yeah. we we played our set, and it was pretty pretty good actually. Went went very well. Um, certainly the biggest audience that I would have played to. Uh, and backstage after the gig, we accosted uh, Wayne Hussey from the Mission for a quick chat, and um, he seemed to know about Simon. He seemed to know that he'd he'd uh, he'd passed away, and we explained what a big fan of the Mission he was, and how thrilled he would have been to be playing here. Um, and during the mission set, he, uh, Wayne dedicated uh, Tower of Strength to Simon, which was, wow. which was really emotional. Wow. Wow. And that would have blown Simon's mind. It would have absolutely blown his yeah. mind. Mm. So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the kind of story and, and kind of going back to the way that, um, I think you talked about it, uh, Nick, you know, Simon was kind of goth for life. He was, that yeah. was his, it was religious yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, I don't think it quite was for us, but there's, I always yeah. go back to to that music and and the way that it made me feel at the time, and I still listen to it to this day. So, so, so that's, that's absolutely, absolutely wonderful, wonderful, Stu. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, absolutely, it's, it's lovely absolutely lovely to, to, to hear that. To hear that. I, just, I just I just know, I just know that that, 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 Simon, that himself Simon himself would be would, would be, be blown, blown away by, as you say, you know, the, the dedication he got from Wayne Hussey. I mean, he would fucking be. Apocalyptic. apocalyptic apocalyptic i like that word <laughs> that's a really it's like What's a sort of malcolm apocalyptic, apocalyptic and cataleptic <laughs> both both of which don't mean happy but i kind of like apocalyptic. he would be fucking off the richter scale happy that's the better way okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah yeah and uh it's lovely hearing you describe that and to talk about that and uh yeah it's quite emotional because this is a nice dedication to simon our dear dear friend and yeah. Yeah. And losing him was was uh, was very very difficult, and remains to be difficult to this day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so 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 lovely. I really really appreciate your input on that, Stu. Yeah, no worries. I mean, for me, around about that time, the the, the music changed as well. So I, I was just looking through again, trying to use the data, so to speak, and looking at the the gigs that we went to. Yeah. Uh, in the years preceding that, and it was you know lots of the bands that we'd already talked about. And in 92, almost nothing. I think I went to the Reading Festival that year, yeah. which was when Nirvana played Public Enemy and the Wonder Stuff, and nothing else. And then there's a period of time where there's really not very many gigs at all, in fact. Yeah. And I think we'd all just kind of moved on to different things in our lives around about that time. 
um, yeah. Simon well, being the exception. And still were you still an REM nut uh, I, I think by 92 then? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I think the band that uh, you and I played in, there was... Yeah, you know, an, an unhealthy hint of REM. In my so lots of lots of arpeggio, and there was, wasn't there? There was yeah. mandolins and things like that. Yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Indeed. indeed. Oh yes, I remember having mandolin envy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I used to like bands like the House of Love around about that time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Did but, I say the Pixies already? I, I, I can't yeah, remember. Pixies. No, Pixies House were great. Love, yeah, I mean they're sort of yeah. outliers on goth and alternative as yeah, well. You on know? The edge, this is kind of pre. Yeah. Yeah, pre yeah. Britpop for sure, um, mm -hmm. but then you know I think one of the things that happens, and this is not terribly uncommon. I mean, we had uh, we had our children in you know in the mid nineties, and and you know you stop kind of doing some of these things, and so yeah, yeah. there's a period of time where um, you know we didn't we didn't go to so many gigs, and so some of those bands around that time we just they, they, they kind of lost to me a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a great, that's a great insight, I think, into 90s goth. And it's, it's not a period that I'd given a lot of thought to. In fact, I kind of like had um, shit canned it, really, in my mind of like, <laughs> night, goth died with uh, Vision Thing. And after that, there was just a sort of a few pale shadows of goth going on. But uh, to hear you talk about uh, the camaraderie, <laughs> Um, and the vibrancy of the underground goth scene in the 90s and beyond is really fascinating. I mean, I, I was personally involved in it, but go, go ahead, break it to me. I, was, I was, hate to break it to you, but Vision Thing, I mean, it was an absolutely shocking album. I mean, shocking. There was no, no. That, wasn't, that wasn't the end of goth, that was the end. Was, the sisters ended away before that. Yeah, 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 no, fair yeah, enough, music, fair enough. I mean, we've we sort of touched on, on that as we've, we've, we've gone, gone through, through the weeks, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it was, it was not... not a goth album no. and uh, uh it's it's not a sort of a it's not a monologue that i've written or or given uh, through this podcast but uh, i had it in my mind to talk about how goth as i've said it, it, at other places goth is about vulnerability about opening up spaces where vulnerability and difficulty and pain and suffering uh has space to be expressed and explored but vision thing is all about ego and confidence and strength and arrogance mm. and a sort of Nietzschean and or Ayn Rand style go and I mean the track more you know it's about you are what you take yeah uh, and this is um, the polar opposite to what I understand as uh, what I understand is goth and alternative yeah. and so it's the, the very opposite, the anathema to the goth that I loved. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Do you think there's a sort of generational cycle to this sort of thing? So in the same way that you've been talking about the doors and maybe yeah. a bit underground and the way that, you know, they sort of engage with people at that time and the way that you've talked at length about the period that, that we all grew up. Yeah. Um, and then sort of later in the 90s and into the 2000s, there was sort of, that kind of emo scene and or maybe the sort of industrial yeah. thing before it with nine inch nails that there's always this kind of need for some sort of outlet that yeah. the slightly darker side of music gives you and it's it has a certain label at a certain time but yeah it's sort of the same thing i think that's absolutely right i mean the title of the, this podcast is uh, amongst other d words darkness never dies and i think uh what that says to me is that there, there is always, always a need, as you say, and, and that this kind of music is always being made. The mainstream cottons onto it here and there, and you get a few breakthrough bands, and they sell a lot of records, and then it goes out of fashion, and it sinks beneath the surface of the mainstream. But the, the bands are always there. They're always coming through that are fulfilling this need and are wanting to explore these areas of life, which um, particularly, particularly younger people, but all people, feel uh, a need to have in their life because it expresses those uh, areas of life which we all need and in other areas of art and literature as well there's always writers and artists that are wanting to explore these darker shadowy um, dominions of the human soul wonderful very good. beautiful <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, so, that encapsulates our entire podcast beautifully. Yeah. I mean, that's right. The darkness never dies. It's always there. It's just uh, sort of the commercial forces will uh, grasp it here and there and feel there's a buck to be made. But the artists are always wanting to keep those spaces open and keep that conversation going <coughs> about what is it to be human and what are these um, yeah, shadowy places that we live within as so well as the sunlit, sunlit places. Yeah. The disowned parts of ourselves. Yes, yes indeed, indeed, that's, that's right. right. Split off parts of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The bits of ourselves that we dare look at. Yeah. The bits of ourselves that we're terrified to look at. Yeah, yeah. That we only grant access to in therapy. Well, that's that right. That we would never mention in polite society. <laughs> but that's what goth music does. It, 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 it exposes us to those areas. Yes, yes. And that's why it's so potent and so meaningful. Yeah, and some people don't want to hear it. They'll say, oh, this is crap music, yeah. and they'll just say it's rubbish. Yeah. But it perhaps provokes feelings in them that they don't want to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Other people, people will embrace it and say, yes, yes I, I want, want to look at this stuff. stuff. Yeah, but it's terrifying to look at as well. Yes. That's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but art makes it possible. Yes, music makes it possible. Yeah. Yes. Socially yes. acceptable. Yeah. Well, not socially acceptable, but no, no. but uh, what is terrifying to look at in therapy uh, is much easier to look at with a glass of wine and a music beat behind it. Well, that's right. Yeah, you know, and friends to share it with. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Stuart? No, I mean yes, yes. I mean we could go on forever, but I think the the thread there is. There's always there is always some sort of music that you would associate it with that sort of darkness, and it was at what point does it intersect also with that aesthetic look as well? And there's bands that mm. I can think of like um, I mean like Billy Billy Eilish now, like that kind of yes yes modern sort of goth sound, and there's yeah. been other bands like the Editors. When you listen to the yeah. music, yeah yeah yeah, sounds goth. They just don't look it. So yeah. they have got sort yeah. of categorized as a, as a goth band. Yeah. But I, I think I think it's 80, 87. I think it's editors, been... not goth. Oh, God. Not oh, no article. He's done no it. He's done it. He's done <laughs> it. Article. And, uh, I mean, one, just one very, very final party thought. I think you've gone an entire 10 episode series without, oh. mention, without mentioning Joy Division. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah no, that's, we have oh, that's a fair that. cop. That's a fair cop. Yeah. Um, can I respond to that? Yes, yes please do. Um, it's, it's cropped up in my mind here and there, like, should I have a Joy Division album? Or should, the, when we talked about the outliers, not in sod, should I bring in Joy Division? Yeah. And in fact, on the Spotify playlist, I put a Joy Division track. Um, and I controversially at one point thought to myself, they're not goth. Why did I think that? Because in, in some, some senses, senses they, they are, are so Spartan in their um, outlook that I felt that most of the things that I would associate with sort of classical or legacy goth, as, as Stuart used the phrase, has some sort of um, theatricality to it. Even the sisters had it. Um, and I'm not sure whether Nico had it, but sort of a lot of the bands in the 80s had it there was a sort of a, a, a sort of self-conscious theatricality to the way they presented the darkness. Uh, Joy Division did not have that. They had this sort of northern, spartan, absolutely... Um, um, I can't quite think of the word. So sort of psychologically raw way of, um, of presenting their music and the subject matter. And I found that and still find that very hard to listen to, I think, because it is so, uh, sun, so unadorned, so unfiltered with the theatrical that I have always struggled to really enjoy Joy Division. Mm. And so I like my darkness mixed with a little bit of sort of sugary <laughs> theatricality <laughs> to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in order to, to make it palatable Same for thing. me. Same and I'll, I'll fully admit that. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I've struggled to bring in Joy Division and, and struggled to love Joy Division. Yeah. But There's a couple of tracks. Sorry, go on. Carry on. I was going to say, no, you, no. Acknowledge, you acknowledge the influence, though, I think. Absolutely. I mean, so. they are they are a towering band and, and they are an utterly original band and a band of, of great importance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to take that away. Mm -hmm. 
um, but personally, they're just a very, they're a very difficult, yeah. very harsh, very raw band. They're a little bit too raw for my taste, yeah, yeah. I'll admit. I think Floyd's the wall. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's, that's no, really not. Well, yeah, but that's, that's really, really difficult, difficult to, to look at, at, isn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah, it's got it's got a lot of pain, a lot of rawness, but I think it has got a sort of a, a you know a big rock stadium filling the, theatricality to it, which makes it um, makes it palatable in ways that some of Joy Division's stuff does not. But so, another yeah. example I know, I know you mean, we have, I know what you need. But, Sorry, but another thing that we have spoken about is the is the uh, pornography by the Cure. See that yes. for me, yes. that that's exactly the same. Yes. We have spoken yeah. about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and that has a very little theatre. Yeah, no, you're uh, absolutely and that right. is kind of very difficult to it's, listen to. It's sort of visceral, like kind of just rawness. And I can remember that with uh, one of the, a couple of the early Bauhaus tracks as well, things like Dark Entries. It was yeah, just yeah. absolutely relentlessly visceral sound. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But, but with yeah. Bauhaus, Bauhaus yeah. has got a lot of theatre though as well. They, they did if you were, yet. but that was visual, right? So just listening to the, the audio yeah. of yeah, Bowles yeah, in suppose, those early yeah. years, it was mm. harsh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, anything yeah. that I'd ever heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Could I just name check Scopes by Bauhaus? I don't know if you know that. It's, I think it's a B-side or a sort of occasional track by them. It's, it's hilarious. It's just Pete Murphy and the rest of the band shouting out different names of Scopes, like Microscope. Stethoscope. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. There's comedy in there. There's comedy yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've not heard yeah. that. It's not brilliant. You should look at it. I've put it on the Spotify playlist. Right. Listen to it. It's great. Right. It's just they just keep going, scopes, scopes, microscopes. What? As if Pete Murphy is suddenly thinking, I've thought of another scope. Stethoscope. Were they just like trying to fill up an album or something? I don't know. It's a B side. They probably had like right. a, a weekend or like they had a Sunday afternoon. And like make a B side and contractual said, obligation. Exactly, yeah. Let's let's just like do a list of scopes. scopes. So we'll call it scopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I think you could do just sort of maybe think. I think you could do a, a podcast at least on the Kurnik. Nothing yeah, really no, I'd love to. I'd love to. Because uh, they're, especially they're because of, they, they, they've reportedly got a, a triple album coming out. They, they've been saying that for about five years, but yes. I know, it, well, a couple of years, yeah. That yeah. arc yeah. of time with The Cure have sort of coincided with with us growing up, and um, I've seen them quite a lot in the last five years, and yeah. they are still immense. I mean, they play yes. for hours mm. and hours. I mean, three, yes. three and a half hours. I know, just, I know. They're, they're a wonder. Amazing. They're yeah. a wonder. Yeah. Which, which kind of segues nicely into me getting my ass out, really. Oh, uh, why, why would you get, why would you get your ass out? Then? Why would well, I Well, I mean, I think, out? I think actually we should say goodbye to our radio audience. We'll say goodbye to our radio visual audience. Content but, occurs, but I have yeah. to say, we're, we're saying goodbye like to I'm, the radio. I'm Canute holding the, the C back here. King Canute. Subscri King Canute. Subscribers only, this one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But if you want a little added extra, this is to the audio audience. Go over to our YouTube channel where you will see my ass. No, don't. Really, don't. I no, advise no, against should. it. I'm I advise nice against ass. it. No, no. It's... I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand firm in this. I have fairly for a 51 year old man. I've got a fairly nice ass. Did you, you just uh, did you shower before you came? No, over, came I did over sweaty ass. Oh my lord! Are you just finishing off the rest of that wine, Stu? I'm gonna get the car left. <laughs> Was it a red or white? <laughs> no, it's a white. So oh, get you. Very brave. You. Very brave. Yeah, looks We've very been nice. on the red here. Yeah. I'm feeling fairly drunk, actually. Well, I, th I think that concludes in fairly sort of messy, um, chaotic yeah. terms yeah. our entire series of podcasts. Yes, and I'd like to say that I love you. Would you? Simon. And I'd like to say that I love you, Stuart. I love you. Both. I'd like to say that I've absolutely had a ball doing yeah. this podcast yeah. and it's been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, even though it's been through very difficult, difficult uh, troubling, troubling periods period in, 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 in the earth. Well, this is sort of a little time capsule of the COVID experience yeah. itself, because like as I go back and edit these, it's like we're in lockdown in March, and yeah. then we're meeting in your allotment mm -hmm. hut mm -hmm. in the middle of summer. So it's yeah, it's this little historical time capsule in mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. But I also love both of you. Oh, bless you from a safe distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've still got two more episodes to listen to that you haven't broadcast yet. So I'm looking forward to those. 
Yeah, before the cringing yes. embarrassment of hearing myself on them. Yes. <laughs> no, no, you've yeah, been wonderful. No, your dulcet, dulcet tones will, will <laughs> yeah. grace the airways yeah. for, for two, possibly three episodes, depending upon how long we've rambled on for yeah. in this last which, episode. Which I think is three, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I think that's that's us done. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thanks Lovely to everybody see you. for listening. Yeah, thank you, and it's been awesome. Thanks to both of you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was me. May- and my name made, is you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the other one, uh, which is someone in Scotland, I believe. Uh, but uh, we uh, we may be uh, releasing a book uh, at some point in the future. So, uh, yeah, that's yeah. something to look forward yeah. to. So there we are. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Uh, and, yeah, goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye-bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.